Wa'alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inna alhamdulillahi nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina. Man yahdihillahu falamudillala wa man yudlil falahadiyala. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallahu wahdahu la shadika lah. Wa ashadu anna muhammadin abduhu wa rasooluh sallallahu alayhi wa la alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama tasliman kathira amma ba'd. Alhamdulillah, yani, uh, after completing the Arab and Nawawi, uh, we are starting the new book that is known as A'lam al-Sunnah li Ta'ifat al-Mansura. A'lam al-Sunnah li Ta'ifat al li Ta'ifat al-Mansura by Imam al-Hafid ibn Ahmad al-Hakim, rahimahullah. So that is the book that we're starting today, inshallah ta'ala. And it's also known as Miyat Su'alin wa Jawabin fi al-Aqidah. That is also known as 200 questions and answers in Aqidah. 200 questions and answers in Aqidah. Now, inshallah ta'ala, to start this book, we're not going to go straight into the book immediately. We'll give uh, some waqafat ma'asirat al-Sheikh rahimahullah that we will ponder over the biography of the Sheikh al-Hafid al-Hakami rahimahullah as there are many benefits that we can take from this biography of the Sheikh. Um, also, when you look into the books of seeking knowledge, the manners, the adab of seeking knowledge, of those things that are mentioned as an encouragement that a student of knowledge may find motivation in, is that they read some of the biographies of the ulama, especially those who are renowned for their knowledge especially those who have a background in hadith as they mentioned you'll find when you ponder over the biographies some of those things that are amazing that this is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no doubt when we ponder over the life of Imam al-Hafid al-Hakimi rahimahullah Considering it was so short, as we'll come to mention, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him great tawfiq, uh, in the assistance and success in being of those who would spread after inheriting this knowledge of those things that is inherited from the prophets, being the ilm that he inherited and spread and taught throughout his short lifetime. So the Sheikh Haf al-Hakim, rahimahullah, was born in the year 1342 Hijri, which coincides with 1924 uh, in the Western calendar. And he was born in a coastal village that is referred to as As-Salam, which is in the south of Jazan from the Mamlaka to Saudi Arabia. And when he was a small boy, he lived with his father and his mother who raised him upon good manners. And he used to um, attend to his father's sheep as a shepherd herding his father's sheep for a number of years, as that was the main source of wealth for their family. And what was mentioned, Hafid ibn Ahmad al-Hakimi was yani, very different from other youth of his age group. And Kama Samahu Abawahu bil Hafid, as his parents named him Hafid, such was the case that he was someone who was a Hafid, those who memorized and had a great ability to memorize. That he, it was mentioned that he memorized the Quran by the time he had reached the age of 12 years old. Now, what was mentioned by some of the ulama, the Hafid al-Hakimi and his brother, they started to seek knowledge. They started to seek knowledge by themselves. There was no sheikh, there was no ulama within their locality or local to them. So they would read the books of the ulama and understand it to the best of their ability and started this process themselves. However, Hafid al-Hakimi, when he had completed the Qur'an, 
he also learnt and mastered the art of handwriting. So of the practices that is uh, still practiced in some places, but a traditional practice of how people memorize the Quran is that they would write the Quran out by hand. Their teacher would they would listen to the Quran be recited by the Sheikh and they would write it down by hand. And that is a traditional practice that is still practiced in some countries, some Islamic countries. Now, Hafiz al Hakim, he mastered the art of handwriting after completing writing the Quran. And after this, shortly after this, a great scholar by the name of Sheikh Abdullah ibn Muhammad ibn Hamd al-Qur'awi, who was Sheikh Imam Hafid al-Hakimi's teacher, had come and traveled from uh, to the southern parts of Saudi Arabia to the city of Tihama. This was not far from, this was near, this was closer to the city of Imam Hafid al-Hakimi, as at that time, in different parts of the Mamlaka, people had turned away from authentic practice of Islam, and innovation had become widespread. Even practice of shirk had become also widespread. But upon hearing of the Sheikh's arrival, Hafid al-Hakimi had written a letter to the Sheikh, and his brother is the one who carried this letter to him. He wrote this letter to the Sheikh expressing his desire for knowledge, asking him to provide them with books, provide them with books that they could read of the scholars, that they can continue to benefit, as their current circumstance did not facilitate for them to go and travel to seek knowledge with the Sheikh as much as they would love to. Now, this is Imam al-Hakimi at a very young age writing this letter to the Sheikh. He wrote this letter to the Sheikh at a very, very young age, maybe by the age of 13. Now, he also requested for the, from the Sheikh Abdullah al Qarawi to visit them in their location and give lessons some days a week. So he accepted the invitation and went to their village, especially when he saw the handwriting of Imam Hafid al-Hakimi. He was amazed by this, that such a young person had this amazing level of handwriting, the skill and precision in his handwriting. So he went and he accepted the invitation. And he got to know Hafid al-Hakimi very well. And he would give lessons a number of days in their village and then he would also return back to his village. And he mentioned himself, he mentioned that I stayed with Hafid and he attended the lessons of mine. And whatever lesson he would miss, any lesson that Hafid al-Hakimi missed, he wouldn't go to the teacher. He would go to his fellow classmates and take from them that which he had missed within the class. And he mentioned, he is like his name, which means one who memorizes. He preserved things accurately by heart as well as with his note taking. So he was someone who would benefit from the class and memorize that which he learned from the class, both by way of that which he had written down and that which he had heard from his sheikh. And I mentioned, I used to dictate to all of the students and then explain the lesson. And the older students used to ask him if they had trouble understanding something or if they missed writing something in their notes. So already, it was notable that Imam Hafid al-Hakimi was of a, a high level of ability in seeking knowledge. That even those who were older than him, the older students would come to him for assistance in seeking to understand that which they couldn't understand from the lesson, as well as recording that which they may have missed from the dictation. And my personal experience of studying with some of the ulama, and some may have also experienced this, is when you attend their classes, you write what they tell you to write. They will tell you, don't write anything except for what I tell you. So they will give the explanation of a class, and then they will say, Taib, Naktub. They say, now we will write. So after explaining the lesson, they will say, now we will write. And they will dictate to you a summary of everything that they just previously mentioned in the explanation. As for you to record the knowledge as they have given it to you. That is also of the ways that knowledge was preserved. And that was the practice that Sheikh Abdullah al-Qur'awi, rahimahullah, had with Hafid al-Hakimi. 
And it mentioned that when he wanted, when he had to return back to this the the, the, the nearby place he was staying at called Tihama, he then went to seek from the parents of Havel Hakimi that he would place in his place someone who would shepherd their sheep and he would take them with him to teach them that they could seek knowledge. However, his parents had a great need for Havel Hakimi. They had a great need for him that they refused and rejected uh, this request. However, the Sheikh didn't stop. He continued to ask. He continued to ask uh, Hafiz's father to allow him to go and seek knowledge with him. Now, after a while, the father, after a while, the mother of Hafiz al Hakimi passed away, rahmatullahi alayha, and then the father allowed and permitted for Haf al-Hakimi and his brother Muhammad to go and visit the Sheikh and study with the Sheikh three days out of the week. Three days out of the week. At this point, Hafid would then travel and seek knowledge and sit with Sheikh Abdullah al-Qarawi and then he would return to his village. And what was mentioned, what was mentioned, Haf al-Hakimi, used to memorize half a juz a day. He said he used to memorize half a juz a day from the Quran, and he would read the same half a juz he memorized in the day, he would read that same portion in the night. Now this is something that is amazing, because sometimes we may memorize one page in a day, and if we was to go and lead the salah, we would struggle to have even the confidence to read that same page in a, in a salah after only memorizing it today. However, half al Hakimi at a young age, he was doing this with half a juz. This is 10 pages of the Quran. 10 pages he would memorize a day, and then he would read those pages in Tarawih. In Tarawih. And he mentioned that half was able to study, and after, after, after he had been permitted to go and study with the Sheikh a number of days a week, not long after this, his father also passed away. His father also passed away. Now, when this happened, Sheikh Abdullah Karawi got someone and put them in place of herding the sheep and took Hafid to study with him full time. So he went to Sheikh Abdullah Karawi and stayed with him and benefited from him and was considered a very gifted student. Also, not only did he learn quickly, he picked up the science of poetry to a very strong level that it was mentioned he would author lines about 200 lines of poetry in the sciences of Islam a day. And some of his works that are famously known from them is the book Sulam al-Usul min uh, ala ilm al-Usul. His book he has is a poem that is 200 plus lines of poetry in Aqidah. Now, what is special about this poem? Sheikh Abdullah Qarawi had requested from him, had requested from him to write a poem in the science of Aqidah for the Muslims. Now, Hafid al-Hakimi at this time was only 19 years old. This is when Hafid al-Hakimi was 19 years old. His Sheikh had then requested from him to write this poem in Aqidah at the age of 19 years old. And not only did he write this poem, he later explained this poem in a book that is also known among the scholars and students of knowledge called Ma'arj al-Qubul. And this is an explanation, an explanation of his own works in this poem that he had written. And they mentioned that there was not a science except he wrote a poem in, in this science. Some of them in great length, some of them in short length. And of the main mutun that you will find in Aqidah today is his poem, Sulam al Wasul. This is his famous poem that he authored at the age of 19. At the age of 19. And it mentioned that uh, Haf al Hakimi was strongly influenced by the works of Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah and his famous student ibn al Qayyim, rahmatullahi alayhim jami'an. At a young age, at a young age, Hafid al-Hakimi was appointed as, a, as someone who would give durus by his sheikh, who would be in charge 
of heading the Rus and also some of the schools that had been set up under the authority of Sheikh Abdullah Al Qarawi, and this would continue for a number of years, a number of years. And what is mentioned that Sheikh Abdul Qarawi mentioned about Half Al Hakimi said, indeed, he is one of my students, but he has surpassed me in knowledge with a far with a far aspiring ambition. And such is the case. Sometimes you'll find a student excels their teacher. A student excels their teacher in a particular science. And sometimes it's because of the inspiration from their teacher, as we have the case with Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah, that when he was when he heard his teacher say, if only someone would write a book of hadith, collecting all the hadith that was authentic, sahih, Imam Bukhari heard that and acted upon it. That was the inspiration that he had heard that made him, that influenced him to become, by Allah's permission, the great scholar of hadith that he has become known globally as. Also, uh, Sheikh Abdullah Qarawi married Haf al-Hakimi to his daughter, to his daughter. Now, Haf al-Hakimi, as we mentioned, started to seek knowledge at a very young age, when there was no sheikh around. He had no sheikh, no alim to go and seek and benefit from, to ask questions, until Sheikh Abdullah Qarawi had come close to, to a city closer to his. And at this point, he was about 13 years old, 12, 13 years old, when he wrote to Sheikh Abdullah Qarawi, seeking to benefit from him, first and foremost by requesting books that him and his brother can benefit from, that they can continue to study together and benefit from, until Allah facilitated for them to study with a sheikh. Now, what is uh, something that is for us to truly ponder over? Had al Imam Haf al Hakimi, he passed away at the age of 35 years old. At the, the age of 35 years old. Now, this was a calamity that, bef that bef had befallen the Ummah because such. An eminent scholar who his works are evidence for that which he has achieved in his level and proficiency in the science of Islam. Also from his students is Sheikh Zaid Al-Madkhali, rahimahullah, who is well known, who passed away not so long ago. Died at a young age of 35 years old. And sometimes we hear some have only started seeking knowledge at this age. But this great imam, that was the age that he returned back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this, this occurred in the city of Mecca when he was afflicted with a sudden illness. A sudden illness at the age of 35 years old and a few months. And that was the cause of the death of this great imam, Hafid. Ibn Ahmed al Hakimi. Now, as I mentioned, of those factors that really aid a student of knowledge in finding motivation and seeking knowledge is being aware of some of the biographies of those who have preceded us. Now, Haf al Hakimi, rahimahullah, lived a short age. But this tawfiq in seeking knowledge and attaining knowledge is not based on your own personal attributes, your own personal skills. All of this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you are someone who's intelligent, if you are someone who memorizes and has the ability to memorize a lot and quickly, then you have to remind yourself that this is a bounty from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Hafid al-Hakimi is of those who used that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed upon him in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for the benefit of this ummah that he took that benefit that Allah has given him of intelligence and suratul hifd and being able to memorize very fast and he began to seek knowledge from a young age and this was his life he dedicated his life to ta'allum wa ta'aleem to learning and teaching and 
attained so much and his works are numerous. And he even has a poem, Al Mimiya Fil Adab al Talib al Alm. He also has a poem that is explained by Sheikh Abdul Razak al Badr, Hafdullah, on the manners of seeking knowledge. On the manners of seeking knowledge. And this is also a very beneficial work of Hafid al Hakimi that the student of knowledge is to refer back to in being aware of those manners and characteristics that they should adorn themselves with as a student of knowledge. And as we mentioned, Hafid al Hakimi. Rahimahullah had did all of the works that he had accomplished and those who had benefited from him to continue spreading Al-Islam, this happened all before he reached the age of 35 years old. And there are a few other scholars who are known who did immense amounts of works, numerous amounts of works. However, they died at a very young age, such as the Imam Anawi, Rahimahullah, who we only finished going through his book last week. We finished going through his work last week. And that was another one of those signposts of this ummah who died at a very young age, however, attained so much and gave so much for the sake of Allah and spreading Al-Islam to the point that he mentioned, if you calculated from all of his works, the amount he accomplished, it was as if he had written a hundred pages a day for the amount of works he has compared to the short amount of time that he had lived. And this is also from the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives an abd a long life, that a person is able to achieve within a short period of time that which people achieve over many years, over many years. And this is from the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his bounty and virtue that he gives to whom he wills. So it's important for the Muslim in all of the affairs to have high aspirations, have high aspirations and to have trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to seek Allah's assistance in that which you would want to achieve. Now, as for the book that we are studying of Hafiz al-Hakimi, rahimahullah, then it's the book A'lam al-Sunnah. It's A'lam al-Sunnah al-Manshura li'atiqal al-Ta'ifat al-Nadiya al-Mansura. Now, that is one name of the book. Another name of this book is Miyata Su'alin wa Jawabin Another name is 200 questions and answers in the belief of the Muslim, the Muslim belief. Now, what is a significant feature of this book? Of the beneficial ways that, that we have seen, even from the, from the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi sallam, when it came to teaching people al-Islam, with tariqa su'al wal jawab, in the way of questions and answers. Now, Hafiz al-Hakimi, Sheikh Imam Hafiz al-Hakimi, rahimahullah, he gives a question and he also provides the answer. Now, what's important about these answers, these questions and answers, these are common questions or matters that we all should know. Yet with the answer, the Sheikh, rahimahullah, he brings the evidence for you. As for example, it's not a, a requirement for every single general Muslim to have theoretical knowledge of these things. However, they are to apply it in their daily life. However, the student of knowledge, the one who wants to be a student of knowledge, they should be aware of the evidence for these matters. It's important that they are aware of the evidence for these matters. And that is the method that, that Imam Hafiz al-Hakimi uses within this book. He provides a question and then he provides an answer that will highlight the evidence in response to these questions. Now, we will mention the main benefits that we can extract from these benefit, from these questions and answers, and also the point of evidence from that which is mentioned in the answer for us to see as the main standpoint for that which is being spoken about. Without going into detail regarding the matters of different groups and different uh, belief systems, except for that which is mentioned within the book. Except for that which is mentioned within the book. We will keep it concise, restricting it to benefiting directly from the text itself and uh, an explanation of this text without going into all differences. Rather, we are to build a foundation first and be aware of the matters for what they are as usul, as fundamental principles before we go into matters of difference between the different sects within Al-Islam that are upon deviance, inshallah ta'ala. Now, 
the first question that Sheikh Hath al Hakimi Rahimullah starts with says, Ma awwalu ma yajibu ala al ibad. What is the first obligation upon Allah's servants? What is the first obligation upon Allah's servants? And he mentions Al Jawab, awwalu ma yajibu ala al ibad. The first thing that is an obligation upon Allah's servants. Ma'arifatul amr alladhi khalaqahum Allah lah. وَأَخَذَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمِيثَاقِ بِهِ وَأَرْسَلَ بِهِ رُسُلَهُ إِلَيْهِمْ وَأَنْزَلَ بِهِ كُتُبَهُ عَلَيْهِمْ That he mentions the first obligation is for Allah's servants to realize the purpose for which Allah SWT Azza wa Jal has created them. The purpose for which he took upon them their covenant and sent them his messengers and books. وَلِأَجْلِهِ خُلَقَتِ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةُ وَالْجَنَّةُ وَالنَّارُ And for this reason created, the earth has been created and the hereafter, the, the worldly life, the hereafter, and the paradise and the hellfire. وَبِهِ حَقَّتِ الْحَاقَةِ وَوَقَعَتِ الْوَاقِعَةِ And for which the inevitable will come true, أَيْ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ And the event would befall, which is also regarding Yawm Al-Qiyamah and for which the balance is set وَفِي شَأْنِهِ تُنْسَبُ الْمَوَازِينَ وَتَتَطَايَرَ الصُّحُفْ وَفِيهِ تَكُونَ الشَّقَاوَةِ وَالسَّعَادَةِ وَلَا حَسْبِهِ تُقَسَّمُ الْأَنْوَارِ وَمَنْ لَمْ يَجْعَلِ اللَّهُ نُورًا فَمَا لَهُ مِنْ نُورٍ and he mentions and for which the balance is set i.e. The, the mizan, the scales that will, record, that will weigh the deeds and the scrolls of the ibad and the records fly, and for which there would be either happiness or misery, according to which the lights would be divided. For any to whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives uh, not light, there will be no light for that person. Now this is the first question. Now from this, it mentions the primary purpose for our existence a person is to be aware of what is the obligation that is upon us. Why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us? From where have I come? And the likes. And these are referred to as ilatul wujud. The questions where a person ponders over their existence. When a person ponders over their existence. So what is mentioned that a person is to know why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them? Why have we been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the first thing that is mentioned, what is the first obligation? Knowing why we have been created. What is the covenant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken upon us that will be discussed at a later time? What is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent his messengers with from a tawheed? Because all of the messengers had called the people to what? Li ibadatillah, li tawheedillah azza wa jal. To the, to the establish the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fi ma yakhtassu bihi. In that which is specific to him. Wa li ajlihi khulakati dunya wal akhira. And because of this, the earth, the world life has been created. The hereafter has been created. Jannah, the paradise, one nar and the hellfire. All of this is going to be discussed within this book. And also matters pertaining to Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Because what is known, what is known is that some believe we have no purpose. There are some who believe that we have been created without purpose. That this is all a game. And this is what led to the second question of the author, Rahimahullah. So the first thing is what is the primary obligation upon you? And that is, as he mentioned, introducing what is going to come next. Is that you know the purpose for why you have been created. Why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you? Why are we here? What is the purpose behind our creation? And that mentions. So, And that's the second question. What is the purpose of creation? What is the purpose of creation? So first... We know what is the first obligation upon us. What is the first obligation? 
upon us. Now, why? This is what we have to know. This is the first obligation. Knowing why we have been created. Knowing why we have been created. Then the Shaykh Rahimullah then mentions, so what is the reason for our creation? Why have we been created? Why are we here? For what purpose? And then the, the Shaykh, he answers, he mentions, Allah Ta'ala, وَمَا خَلَقْنَا السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا لَاعِبِينَ مَا خَلَقْنَاهُمَا إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ That he mentions in the first part of the answer that Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala mentioned and we have not created the heavens and the earth and that which is between them in play, in jest. We have created them. We have created them. We haven't created them except with truth. However, many of them do not know. Most of them, majority of them do not know. The majority of them do not know. Then Allah mentions, وَمَا خَلَقْنَا السَّمَاءَ وَالْأَرْضَ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا بَاطِلًا ذَلِكَ ظَنُّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا We have not created the sky, the heaven and the earth and that which is between them in falsehood. That is the thinking of those who have disbelieved. That is the thinking of those who have disbelieved. And Allah also mentions, وَخَلَقَ اللَّهُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ بِالْحَقِّ وَلِتُجَزَ كُلُّ نَفْسٍ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ and Allah mentions, and we, and Allah has created the heavens and the earth with truth in order that each person may be recompensed for that which he has earned and they will not be wronged. Then Allah mentions, وَقَالَ تَعَالَى وَمَا خَلَقَتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ And I have not created jinn or mankind except to worship me alone. Now what it mentions now, this last ayah that is mentioned in the explanation, the Shaykh uh, Hafidahullah, she mentions this would be more befitting to be the first ayah that was mentioned as evidence for this question. Why? Because this is the most, the clearest ayah, the clearest evidence as to why we have been created. As Allah explicitly mentions, وَمَا خَلَقَتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created jinn kind, nor mankind, except for one reason except for one hikmah, one wisdom, and that is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone without attributing any partners to him at all. That is the primary reason behind the creation of mankind. لِعِبَادَةِ subhanahu wa ta'ala wahdahu, And that's what Allah has mentioned here. Also, what has been mentioned in the previous ayat, that we have not been created in jest, nor in play, as mentioned by the Arabs of Jahiliya, they used to say, إِنَّمَا هَذِي الْحَيَاةِ إِنَّهَا أَرْوَاحٌ تَدْفَعْ وَأَرْضٌ تَبْلَعْ They used to say that indeed this life is just souls who give birth and a earth that swallows. I.e. we have no purpose. That the reason we are here is for no reason. We have just been created. We just give birth and then the earth swallows us. That's what it is. That's what they saw as being life. The purpose of life. There is no purpose. That this life is just people giving birth and the earth swallowing them up. That is the way, the thought process of who? Those who disbelieved. Those of Jahiliya. But Allah has mentioned, we have created the heavens and the earth and that which is between them for a clear purpose. In truth, not in falsehood, not in jest. Not that a person lives in this life. La yu'maru wa la yunha that they, they, they live their life without having any commands upon them, nor any prohibitions. This is not the case. Whereas the natural inclination of mankind is that they always are seeking something to worship. They are always seeking something to worship. There is no one on the face of the earth who says they do not worship anything. Even the one who tries to say they don't worship anything, who are abidly hawa, he is someone who is worshipping his desires. The one who claims to worship nothing, they don't believe in Allah, they don't believe in the existence of Allah and the like. This person is in fact worshipping their desires. So there is no one except that they are in need of worshipping something. And that is why you'll find, unfortunately, when, we, when you traverse through the earth 
or even read about the histories of different people across the earth, you have those who worship animals. You have those who worship body parts. You have those who worship things that are displeasing. Yet, it's because of their need to always have something that they worship, something that they submit to. Yet, Allah SWT has told us, this is why he has created us. This is the reason behind our creation. That Allah SWT created us in order for us to worship him. And that is also the first command within the Quran. Allah says, Ya ayyuhal nas, u'budu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum walladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattakun. Allah mentions in the Quran, O oh mankind, addressing all of mankind, addressing all of mankind, worship your Lord who has created you and those who preceded you so that you may be of those who attain a taqwa. Now, this is the primary reason behind our creation that we have been created to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nothing else to fulfill those commands that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed upon us. That is the primary purpose of our creation. Not to be of those who believe that we have been created without purpose, that this life is just to be lived in mere jest and play, and that a person is not going to be taken into account, that a person is never commanded of any commands, nor do they have any prohibitions upon them. Like, this is not the way of the Muslim. But unfortunately, we have those who believe this. You have those who believe that this life, as we mentioned, from the ways of Jahiliyyah is that they mentioned this is a uh, this is a place that souls give birth, people give birth, and then the earth just swallows them. That is the purpose of life. That is the reality of life. Ac not acknowledging that they have been created for a reason, and that is what mentioned in the first question. What what yani? They mentions that the, the obligation upon us is one to know why we have been created, what is the covenant that Allah has taken upon us, and also that which the prophets have been sent with. What is the message that the prophets have been sent with to us? What is that message? When a person acknowledges this, and becomes aware of the Risala. And for us, it's the Risala of the Quran that was sent to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As this is the final ummah that is in the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that are to be of those who follow the commands of the Quran. That is the message. What is the message within the Quran? Those ayats that the Shaykh rahimullah then mentioned. وَمَا خَلَقَتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That Allah mentions, I have not created jinn kind, nor mankind, Except that they are to worship me alone. Except that they are to worship me alone. So this is important for a person to know that one, Allah has placed within our fitrah that we know Allah is the one who has created us. Allah is the one who has created us. As Allah mentions in the Quran, وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ لَيَقُولُنَّ اللَّهِ when you ask them, who is it the one who has created the heavens and the earth, then surely they're going to say Allah SWT. None of them will deny this. They will all affirm this is for Allah SWT. And Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah, in his tafsir, he mentions, regarding those ayats that mention what Allah SWT has created, it says, The one who has created all of these things, then he is the one who is deserving of worship. If we know Allah SWT has created the heavens and the earth and that which is between them, then we are to know who Then Allah Azzawajal is the one who is truly deserving of worship. Allah SWT is the one who is deserving of all worship. And that is the reason for why we have been created. And it mentions, وَلِتُجَزَى كُلُّ نَفْسٍ بِمَا كَسَبَتْ وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ Allah SWT is the one who has created the heavens and the earth in truth in order to compensate every soul for that which they have earned from goodness or from evil 
وَهُمْ لَا يُظْلَمُونَ They will not be wrong. They will not be dealt with wrongly. They will receive their recompense, their reward in justice. بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَبِالْحِكْمَةِ as from the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent us messengers is to establish the hujjah upon us. No one can come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that has heard the message and say, I wasn't aware, I didn't know. Because this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent this from the hikam, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent his prophets and messengers in order to give the people the warning of that which is displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to give them glad tidings for when they fulfill that which they have been commanded to do. Now this was from the main reasons, the main hikam behind Allah SWT sending his prophets and messengers. So when a person meets Allah SWT يوم القيامة لتجزى كل نفس بما كسبت وهم لا يظلمون that they will receive their recompense for that which they achieved, that which they earned in this life from their own doings, their own actions, they will not be dealt with unjustly. They will not be wronged. Rather they will receive the recompense for that which they have done. وَهَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ Is the reward for Ihsan. Anything but Ihsan. That those who do righteousness, they will receive good reward as a recompense for that which they have brought forth. And also, as we mentioned, وَمَا خَلَقَتُ الْجِنُ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبَدُونَ This ayah is the most explicit and clearest ayah in mentioning the hikmah the reason, the wisdom behind why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us. That is to establish his worship. That is to establish his worship. And what is mentioned, ayyuwahidun, to establish tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now what is tawheed? Because some say, oh, everyone talks about tawheed. We talk about tawheed too much. This is the primary reason for why we have been created. To worship Allah alone, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is tawheed. Now to singular Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all that is specific to him from his lordship, which is Allah's actions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who creates us, sustains us, provides for us, the one who controls all affairs. This is Allah's lordship. This is singling out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by way of Allah's actions. What are those actions that Allah has informed us that he does? He created us. He creates. He sustains. He provides. He controls all of that which occurs in his dominion. For him belongs everything. This is from the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also from this, Tawheed al-Uluhiyya. This is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone by way of our actions. This is singling out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by way of the actions of the ibad. By way of the actions of the ibad. And then Tawheed of Allah's asma wa sifat. Singling out Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by way of his names and attributes. These things we have mentioned in previous lessons, and they will come within this book. But when a person truly understands Allah's names and his attributes, then they will know for certain. They will know for sure. And Allah, when a person knows Allah's names and attributes, they will know for sure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who deserves all forms of worship. And you have some also, they mentioned Tawheed is of two main types. Tawheed al-Mursil. This is the Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one, who has, the one who sends his prophets and messengers, the one who has sent down the books. This is Tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's called Tawheed al-Mursil. Then you have those who refer to Tawheed al-Mursil as a second character, um, category. And that is the Tawheed of the one who has been sent, the messenger. How does this occur? وَهُوَ إِفْرَادُ الرَّسُولُ صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمُ بِالطَّاعَةِ وَالْإِتِّبَاعِ وَتَقْدِيمُ قَوْلَهُ صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمُ عَلَى قَوْلِ غَيْرِهِ وَيُسَمِّهِ بَعْدِ الْعُلَمَاءِ تَوْحِيدِ الْمُتَابَعَةِ This is also referred to as Tawheed al-Mutaba'ah. This is refers to the Tawheed of singling out the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم in obedience, i.e. following his commands. What is the evidence for that? وَمَا أَتَاكُمُ الرَّسُولُ فَخُذُوهُ وَمَا نَهَاكُمْ عَنْهُ فَانْتَهُوا Whatever the Prophet Muhammad SAW has ordained upon you, then you are to fulfill it. And whatever he has prohibited you from, then you are to stay away from it. Now, as we mentioned regarding the things that a person says sing like Allah SWT in, then what is mentioned regarding uh, that which is uh, in regards to the Prophet Muhammad SAW 
alayhi wa sallam, then this consists of four matters. That one, tasdeeq al-Nabi sallam fi ma akhbara, that you are to believe and affirm that which the Prophet Muhammad sallam has informed us of. That is the first part. Wa ta'at al-Nabi sallam fi ma amara, and to obey the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in that which he has commanded. In that which he has commanded. Secondly, thirdly, اجتناب ما نها عنه النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم That a person is to stay away from that which the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم has prohibited us from. And all of this comes from the ayah وما أتاكم الرسول فخذوه ما نهاكم عنه فانتهوا. That is obeying his command. Also, Allah mentions من يتع الرسول فقد أطاع الله Whoever obeys the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then he has obeyed Allah azza wa jal. Whoever obeys the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then he has obeyed Allah azza wa jal. Also, what is mentioned, Allah yu'badu Allah azza wa jal illa bima shara'ahu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Kama qala, man amila amana laysa lahu, laysa alayhi amruna fa huwa radd. كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة. All of these that the person has mentioned. One, so a person is to only worship Allah as the Jal as the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم had legislated. I had commanded. As I mentioned, whoever does any action that is not from our religion, not from our way, then it shall be rejected. No one can worship Allah except for how the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم taught us to worship Allah. This is matters that are tawqifiyya, i.e. they are derived from the Qur'an and the Sunnah. It's not for a person, it's not for a person to claim that they know a way to worship Allah better than the way of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as that is the reality of a person who believes they can worship Allah in any way, shape or fashion they feel they have this connection. La, this is not Islam. Islam is obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and obeying his messenger. As Allah mentions, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ Say to them, O Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, If you love Allah عز و جل, فَاتَّبِعُونِ يُحْبِبُكُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ He mentioned, say to them, If you truly love Allah, then follow me. I follow who? The Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. And as a result of this, Allah shall love you and forgive you your sins. So those are the four matters that a person is to uphold regarding uh, singling out the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, i.e. believing him in that which he's informed us of, of that which has happened, that which is going to happen, that which happened during his time, before his time, that which had come to us authentically by the way of the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we are to believe this. <coughs> uh, secondly, Obeying the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in that which he has commanded. Man yuti'i Allah, man yuti'i faqad ata Allah. Whoever obeys the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then he has obeyed Allah Azza wa Jal. And he says, Ya ayyul adina amanu ati'u Allah wa ati'u al-Rasul wa ulil al-amri minkum fa intanaza'atum fi shay'in fa rudduhu ila Allah wa al-Rasul. That he mentions, O oh, you who believe in English rendering, O oh, you who believe, Obey Allah Azza wa Jal and obey the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and those in charge over you. It mentioned, Ati'u Allah, obey Allah, wa Ati'u Rasul, and obey the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and those in authority of you. I.e., when it comes to obedience to those in authority of, over you, then this is also to be in obedience to Allah and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I.e., you do not obey them in that which is disobedience to Allah and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alayhi wasallam. And then it mentions If you have dispute In anything Then return it to Allah and his messenger I return it to the Quran And the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And then it mentions Staying away Staying away from that which he has uh, Prohibited us from As it mentions in the ayah that which he has ordained upon you, then you are to do it. And that which is prohibited you from, 
then you are to stay away from it. And I remember listening to one of the ulama, they mentioned this ayah shows that everything that the Prophet Muhammad has commanded upon us by way of the sunnah is in the Quran, by way of this ayah. If a person truly understands the Quran, especially those who say, I only take from the Quran, they do not take from the Quran if they reject the sunnah. A person who says, I take from the Quran, but reject the sunnah does not take from the Quran. As this ayah clearly tells you, whatever the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu has commanded you with, then you are to do it. Whatever he has prohibited you from, then you are to stay away from it. You are to stay away from it. And they mentioned this evidence that every sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu is in the Quran bisifat ama in way of generalization of this ayah. By way of generalization of this ayah. Then it mentions, then it mentions the last point that a person is to only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by way, by the way that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa has commanded and taught us. And they mentioned the hadith, man amila amila laysa alayhi, alayhi amruna fuhu arad. Whoever does any action that is not from our affairs, i.e. not from our religion, then it shall be rejected. It shall be rejected. So that is what is upon a person to know why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us. Why has Allah Azza wa Jal created us? And when a person knows this, this necessitates actions. This necessitates actions that you are to act upon that knowledge that now you know. The first obligation is knowing, first and foremost, to know why you have been created. Now that we know, now that we know, Allah has not created us except that we worship him. Now, what is it, ibadah? What is it to be an abd? What does it mean to be a servant of Allah? Azza wa now, these are the following questions that the Shaykh Rahimahullah mentions. And he mentions, uh, What is the meaning of the word abd? A servant of Allah. Azza wa Jal. He mentions, الْعَبْدُ إِنْ أُرِيدُ بِهِ الْمُعَبَّدُ أي المذلل المسخر فهو بهذا المعنى شامل لجميع المخلوقات من العوالم العلوية والسفلية من عاقل وغيره ورطب ويابس ومتحرك وساكن وظاهر وكامن ومؤمن وكافر وبر وفاجر وغير ذلك The dimensions In one sense the word abd may refer to uh, the subdued or, subju or subjugated Meaning The one who Has been commanded with worship The one who is by default A servant In need And in servitude Or the one who is Placed in any situation Out of their uh, Whether they like it or not they cannot determine their life. They must suffer. Allah SWT uses them as he wills. Then with this meaning, this encompasses all of the creation, all aspects of creation. Everything of the creation is within this meaning, i.e. everything from whether it's from the world of uh, the heavens, the unseen, from the malaika, also from the matters that are on the earth, whether it's from that which is rational, irrational, that which is moist, that which is dry, that which moves, that which doesn't move, that which is present or that which is hidden, the believer, the disbeliever, the pious one, the, the wretched, uh, the evil one, and other than this, and other than this, all of this is from the everyone, every single thing on the face of the earth is from the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kullu, al kullu makhluqun lillahi azza wa jal. Everything is created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, marbubun lahu, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the rock of all of them. Allah nurtures all of his ibad. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. We say in Surah Al-Fatiha, all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Lord of all that exists. I, everything is marbubun, is owned and under Allah's nurturing. Musakharun bi tashkhirihi, at Allah's disposal. Mudabbirun bitadbirihi. Allah SWT controls all of the creation's affairs. Nothing occurs except by the command of Allah Azza wa Jal. Wa li kulli minha rasmun yaqifu alayhi. 
and everyone has the, 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 the thing that distinguishes them. Now what is mentioned, وَحَدٌ يَنْتَهِ إِلَيْهِ And also an appointed time. وَكُلٌ يَجْرِي لِأَجْرِ مُسَمَّى Again, and yet they have a point in time. لا يتجاوزه مثقال ذرة. No one shall surpass the, surpass the appointed time. Nothing will surpass the appointed time of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Everything runs its course and has its has its destination. It's appointed time. Everything runs its course that Allah subhanahu wa taala has Allah wa has put in place. And it mentions ذلك تقدير العزيز العليم. ذلك تقدير العزيز العليم. That is the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now what is mentioned, وَإِنْ أُرِيدَ بِهِ الْعَابِدَ الْمُحِبُّ وَالْمُتَدَلِّلْ خُصَّ ذَلِكَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ خُصَّ ذَلِكَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ هُمْ عِبَادُهُ الْمُقَرَّمُونَ وَأَوْلِيَاؤُهُ الْمُتَّقُونَ الَّذِينَ لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ And it mentions, it's also, if it means those who love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this is specific to who? The believers. This is specific to the believers. Those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored, and those who are his awliya, those who there is no fear upon them, and they will be, and they will not grieve. That is the promise Allah has given those believers. Now, what is mentioned? As for evidence for the first type, it mentions in the Quran. Allah mentions, "In kullu man fi samawati wal ardi illa at rahmani abda." There is nothing in the face of the heavens or the earth except they will come to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala on the day of Judgment, abdan lahu, as a servant of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Now that is, yani kullun ibad Allah. That is all of them being the servants of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And also mentions, "Wallahu man fi al-samawat wal-ard kullu lahu qanitun." And to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala belongs those who are in the heavens and the earth. All of them are submissive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are all submissive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether they like it or not, they are all servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as for those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and those, those who submit out of love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Allah mentions, Inna ibadi laysa laka alayhim sultan. As for my servants, then you do not have any authority over them. Addressing Iblis. وَإِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ Allah mentions that this characteristic. وَإِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ And those servants of Ar-Rahman. This is the title given to those who submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with love. Those who submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with love. So that is important also to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi laylat al-Isra wa al-Mi'raj. Subhanahu alladhi asra bi'abdihi He mentions bi'abdihi Just referring to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam So this shows that this title of being an abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Is of the best titles that a person can be given That they can be referred to as an abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Meaning those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves Those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves at the Instagram live, I'm going to stop it and start again as it's 10 seconds remaining. <laughs> so in terms of knowing the meaning of an abd, then as we mentioned, there are two types. The abd, that is the general meaning that everything is from the ibad of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything is from the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the creation. Then the second meaning that is specific to who? Those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. Those who worship Allah and submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and submit themselves to Allah subhanahu 
wa ta'ala, then that is the meaning of abd. That is the meaning of the abd, meaning al-ibad, that are loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and submit themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, in contrast to those who are abd by default, i.e. every one of the creation is from the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we know now, as we mentioned, and we're going to just reflect the first obligation upon all of us is one, knowing why we are here. For what reason have we been created? Everyone on the face of the earth, whether they like it or not, is searching for purpose. People may deny it. He may say they're happy. But you will find instances in their life, they reflect that if they haven't found purpose, they will never truly be happy. A person who has not found purpose will never truly be happy. So the first obligation upon us is knowing why are we here? For what reason have we been created? Now, what is that reason we have been created for? When a person knows this, now they have purpose. A person will realize their purpose in life when they are aware of the reason we have been created. Where can we find this? We find it from that which Allah SWT has revealed to mankind by way of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Allah told us, I have not created jinn kind nor mankind except that they worship me alone. That is why Allah SWT has created us. We mentioned, We have not created the heavens nor the earth nor that which is between them in jest and play. Allah SWT has created them in truth. That's why Allah mentions in another ayah. In order for those ibad, those who are the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be recompensed for that which they have earned, whether it's good, whether it's evil, for that which they have done themselves. I have they followed the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Have they not followed the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Okay, so what is the recompense? If you fulfill the command, as you mentioned, is the reward for goodness anything but goodness? As for those who have done evil, then they will be rewarded with the likes of that which they have done. No one shall be dealt with unjustly or wrongly on that day. And Allah SWT has sent down messengers with the message of a tawheed to establish the worship of Allah SWT alone, to establish the proof against mankind. So no one can come, having heard the message, to say, no one came to me, I didn't know about this, la. Except for those no one had, those who have not heard anything regarding the message of Islam, then for them they are ma'dur. They have an excuse with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have an excuse with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is not from our concerns. As, Allah, as the Prophet mentioned in Husn Islam al Mari, Tarkuhu la ya'nihi, Tarkuhu ma la ya'nihi. From the best of a person's Islam is that they, do, they leave off that which does not concern them. They leave off that which does not concern them. So as for those who may be considered disbelievers, apparently, that we do not know, they may be lived in the deserts, in the mountains, where no one ever reached them or something, they never heard about Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows their affairs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who will deal with them and judge them accordingly to al Qiyamah. Allah is not asked about that which he does, however the creation shall be asked. We are not to ask Allah about what's going to be the situation of this person, that person. This is from the affairs specific to Allah Azza wa Jal. It has no, nothing to do with us. We are not to ask about it. Our concern is why we have been created. Why are we here? And what are we doing with that purpose? Now that we know, what do we do? Okay, we are all ibad of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every one of the mankind is from the ibad of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, what kind of abd am I? Am I just a general abd that is from the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or am I of the ones who submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bil hubbi wa ta'zim bil mahabba wa ta'zim with love and glorification because this is when a person becomes an abd and submits when they love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also glorify Allah azza wa jal and then that takes us to the next question when the Shaykh Rahimullah mentions, 
ما هي العبادة what is worship many mentions العبادة هي اسم جامع لكل ما يحبه الله ويرضاه من الأقوال والأعمال الظاهرة والباطنة والبراءة مما ينافي ذلك ويضاده he mentions عبادة worship is a comprehensive word for every single thing that Allah SWT loves and is pleased with from statements and actions that are apparent or hidden, eternal, internal, and staying away from everything that will contradict or oppose this. This is ibadah. This is ibadah. So a person can never come and make up ibadah. La. Ibadah is this, that which has been mentioned. From those actions, from those statements, the shahada, from those actions that are apparent, like salah, was zakat, wal hajj, siyam, they mentioned, even though some may say it's apparent, what may be correct is that it's from the internal actions. A person could be sitting right next to you and you will never know if they're fasting unless they told you, I'm fasting. This is of those things that is internal. And also, just as a benefit, Siyam is also a name of Sabr. If you look at Ibn al-Qayyim's book, Iddat uh, al-Sabirin, Iddat al-Sabirin, Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, he mentions that Sabr, patience, has a number of names. And from them is Siyam. And that a person is patient upon leaving of food and drink and their desires. And that is the na a name of patience. So patience has specific names when it comes with specific actions or situations. So Siyam is also from the names that Ibn Qayyim mentions. It's from the names of as sabr So Siyam is from those actions that are internal. <coughs> also, Al-Aqidah, the Aqidah, the belief, a person having truthfulness, Uncertainty. These are actions that are internal, actions of the heart. Tawakkul, khawf, raja. All of these actions of fear and hope and reliance upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, true dependency upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are actions within the heart. So it's important for a person, it's important for a person to know this is what ibadah is and to stay away from everything that will negate this. Allahu A'lam, as for that definition, um, I'm only sticking to the definition as we mentioned uh, by the Sheikh. Rahimahullah. Also, what is then mentioned, knowing what ibadah is, now we also have to know, mata yakunul amalu ibadatan. And this is the last question we'll take today, and it's the fifth question. When does an action become worship? When does an action become worship? And he mentions, إِذَا أُكْمِلَ فِيهِ شَيْئَانِ وَهُمَا كَمَالِ الْحُبِّ مَعَ كَمَالِ الذُّلِّ قَالَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَشَدُّوا حُبَّا لِلَّهِ وَقَالَ تَعَالَى إِنَّ الَّذِينَ هُمْ مِنْ خَشَّةِ رَبِّهِمْ مُشْفِقُونَ وَقَدْ جَمَعَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ فِي قَوْلِهِ إنهم كانوا يسارعون في الخيرات ويدعوننا رغبا ورهبا وكانوا لنا خاشعين. They mentions when does a deed become ibadah and it mentions if two elements are fulfilled perfect love for Allah alone perfect love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala along with perfect submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's taken from the ayah where Allah says والذين آمنوا وشدوا حبا لله in the English rendering, and those who believe are those who love Allah SWT the more than anything else. And also, and those who verily those who live in awe or for fear of their Lord, those who live in awe, live in awe for fear of their Lord. And it mentions that Allah has uh, combined between both of these matters in another ayah. Um, Allah mentions. Uh, verily they used to hasten on to do good deeds and used to call upon us with hope and fear and used to humble themselves before us. 
اي انهم كانوا يسارعون في الخيرات يدعوننا رغدا رغبا ورهبا وكانوا لنا خاشعين and that is when a person combines between in this ayah Allah combined between both of these characteristics this is when an act becomes ibadah this is when an act becomes ibadah when a person has love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which necessitates ta'zim wal istislam that necessitates a person glorifying Allah and submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and also kamal al-dhub that kamal al which is that complete submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now from this we also understand and must mention those conditions for acceptance of ibadah when the action is of ibadah is correct is when it's done with ikhlas which is going to be kamal al hubbi wa dhul with ikhlas and also mutaba'ah which also mentions as we mentioned the the conditions of uh, the shahada of the tawhid of the prophet muhammad sallallahu that the last condition of, of uh, actions being correct and acceptable following the sunnah of the prophet muhammad sallallahu they have to be done in accordance to the teachings of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam so that is of the things that is important for a person to know regarding matters pertaining to al ibadah wal ubudiyah servitude towards allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that every one of the creation is from the servants of allah azza wa jal what are those matters that we must know what is the purpose of our creation why are we here for what reason have we been created once we know this and that is knowing as allah mentions wa ma khalaqtu al-jinna insa illa liya'budun Allah has mentioned we have not created mankind nor jinn can accept to worship me alone, then we are to understand this is our obligation. Now I act upon it. How do I act upon it? I have to know what ibadah is. What is worship? What are those acts of worship that I've been commanded to do? What is an obligation upon me to do that I must fulfill these acts of worship? Okay? And that was, in general, uh, a summary of those five first five, first five questions. One, knowing why we are here, what we have been created for, why the heavens, the why the uh, the world life and hereafter has been created, why the hellfire and the paradise has been created, why the Allah has placed the mizan, the scales that will weigh up a person's deeds. All of this is also based upon the reason why we have been created. Okay, because when we establish why we have been created, people will be held accountable yom al qiyamah. Based upon this, have they established and fulfilled the purpose of creation? And it's an obligation to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. That's the command. And that's the first command in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah that Allah addresses all of mankind with. Ya ayyuhal nasu budu rabbakum. Oh, 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 mankind, worship your Lord. That is the first command that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded upon his creation. And the first prohibition And do not make any partners for Allah SWT while you know So the first command is what? Establishing worship of Allah SWT alone The first prohibition for all of mankind To not do anything that negates that To stay away from that which will negate Being an abd of Allah SWT In terms of those who are loved by Allah Who submit to Allah uh, out of love and glorification and submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then also to know what is ibadah what is worship as we mentioned ismun jami'un li kulli ma yuhibbuhu allahu yardah min aqwalin wa af'alin al-batina al-zahira wa al-batina wal bara'a mimma yunafi thalika wa yudaduhu so it's, the, it's a comprehensive noun for everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and is pleased with from statements and actions that are hidden and apparent and to stay away from everything that will negate this. To stay away from everything that will negate this. And also to know when does an action become ibadah. You see, because a person can pray salah, but if there was no intention, there was no intention for salah aslan, this was not done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is not ibadah. This is not ibadah. It's just an act of, it looks like the act of ibadah, but it's free, it's void of any validity as an act of ibadah because it doesn't have love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
no submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is why it's important to also know when does an action become ibadah. And a general thing, just to mention a general benefit that some of the ulama mentioned, it's not for every general Muslim. The general Muslim doesn't have to know all of these things in detail with evidence and the likes. However, the student of knowledge should strive to do so. It's befitting for the student of knowledge to know these things, okay? So you cannot, don't quiz the general person and say, oh yeah, if you don't have this, then you're khalas, you're not a Muslim and the likes. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that, okay? Because a person in general, the general Muslim, they they love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're not going to say, La, I don't love Allah azza wa jal. And they submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this is the studying the theory behind these principles along with their evidences, okay? So when we discuss these things, especially when we give da'wah, a person says, why are we here? You can answer why we are here. We are here to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, okay? Where did you get that from? Allah subhanahu wa says in the Quran, وَمَا خَلَقَتُ الْجِنُ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created mankind nor jinn kind except to worship me alone. So now we have the evidence for why we have been created. Why we have been created. And that is very important for those who give da'wah. To have the evidence for these, these principles, these foundations of the belief of the Muslim. Because you're going to have these discussions. And it's not befitting for the one who wants to give da'wah. And call people to Islam to have these discussions based upon absent knowledge. It's not befitting to have these discussions based upon absent knowledge. Because what happens is sometimes we go through books, textbooks or apparent evidences, interpret them with our own interpretation and then our application is wrong. So for us, we learn this to implement it, especially for those who are teachers and those who call others to Al-Islam. Uh, inshallah ta'ala so with that we will stop there and that was our, an introduction and the first five questions inshallah ta'ala we will aim we will aim <clears throat> to take at least uh, five questions or so a week inshallah ta'ala five questions or so a week depending on the length of the questions and those matters pertaining to them inshallah ta'ala as for the question what knowledge should the general Muslim have then I would personally say they should learn the hadith of Jibril alayhi salam. Learn the hadith of Jibril alayhi salam. So we'll end with that inshallah ta'ala. Jazakum lahu khayran subhanak lahu bihamdik shadu la ilaha illa anta safru wa tubu ulayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.